10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Roger, we got a roll program. Tower cleared. Roger, roll. When people say to me, how did you get the space program, I said I was fired. As World War II comes to an end, British workers return home to a changed landscape, and many seek new opportunities overseas. Aircraft company Avro Canada provides skilled workers with a fresh start. And I arrived in Canada in uh, the first week of December 1952. It was Christmas time and I remember not knowing a soul walking through the streets of Toronto asking myself what the heck have I done. I joined Avro in late 53, fresh out of line training with the Royal Air Force. There's a right and wrong way to jump too. On the 4th of October 1957, Avro unveils its latest jet fighter, the Canadian CF-105 Arrow. Later the same day, the Soviet Union sends shockwaves around the world as it launches Sputnik into space. We were fascinated as Sputnik passed overhead on a, on a late evening. But of course, we were not in the space business at that time. Whilst the Soviets take the lead in the space race, the Canadian government cuts funding to Avro. The Diefenbaker government cancelled the Avro contract and threw about 15,000 people out of work. Black Friday, we refer to it as. We got fired over the PA system, as a matter of fact, and that's an interesting side story. The talented pool of ex-Avro employees is too good an opportunity to pass up for America's newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration. On the 14th of March, 1959, senior NASA staff traveled to Canada to interview and recruit workers to join their team. It's 4.30. There was a call from Jim Chamberlain, and he said that there were some people from NASA there. Uh, the guys came up there, they interviewed 55 of us on a, on a Friday, and on Saturday morning they offered 30 of us jobs. NASA is finding its feet as an agency and still playing catch up with the Soviet Union. Newly recruited British ex-Avro employees quickly settle in to key positions. He pointed in the corner and he said, this is Pete Armitage. And his next words were, he is the project manager on the parachute. Nobody had ever told me that. And then, even worse, he said, Pete, why don't you tell him how you're going to run the program? I've got to go to another meeting. And he left. I think probably the reason that some of us got chosen was it not that we knew anything about space programs, but that we were flight test people, and we were part of the clan, so to speak. We had the right attitude and the right language. Their influence grows as the US strives to overtake the Soviets in the space race. Every time you picked up a paper, you could, you could see that you were in something big because it was in the paper. Some rise to positions as managers and division chiefs. British employee Rod Rose becomes assistant to the first NASA flight director, Chris Kraft. Chris Kraft later remarked on Rod Rose saying, I put him on my staff and whenever I had a problem, whenever I wanted an answer, whenever I wanted anything done right, I gave it to Rod Rose. As NASA pushes forward with space programs, Mercury, Gemini and Apollo, Brits play an important part in the setup of mission control and spacecraft tracking. The big screens at the front, that was pure publicity. And we never really did need it. Nobody understands that the only reason we put it there for was publicity. <laughs> but everybody copied it, right? As NASA expands, ex-Avro employees are elevated to senior positions. One such employee is John Hodge, who becomes NASA's second flight director. By the time we were at the end of Germany, we started doing the Apollo program. So I took on, on the Apollo program, the, the unmanned Apollo part. As the US gears up to land on the moon, one ex-Avro Brit makes a big contribution to Neil Armstrong's training. I got this call and I remember, Dr. Gilruth is waiting for you. He 
He said, we got problems with the LL TV. So we lost two vehicles, we got one left, we got Armstrong to train, and uh, we got big problems. And there's the lunar mission coming up. He said he wanted me to take over the program. Peter Armitage takes up the offer and helps save the program, giving Armstrong the chance to get the practice he needs. Meanwhile, outside of NASA, other Brits are also making their mark. The fuel cell, which may be an abundant source of power before long, was demonstrated by its inventor, Mr. Francis Bacon, at Cambridge. The current generated can be applied to anything that can be electrically driven. As Bacon himself puts it, from submarines to spaceships. Pratt & Whitney, part of United Aircraft, take out the US patent on Bacon's revolutionary system. They use thousands of staff and millions of dollars to develop bigger and better fuel cells, which NASA used to power the Apollo spacecraft. The American space program also attracts young British engineer Keith Wright. And I was a space nut, so uh, I applied. We were doing some preparation for some of the work we were going to do. Our NASA uh, opposite number said to me, he says, we need you down here. How about next week? Wright is contracted to work on the experiment packages that accompany Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the surface of the moon on Apollo 11. Our team of, of seven, we signed the back of this. The bracket had uh, thermal paint on the front, but the back was just anodized aluminium. So we signed my name, wrote UK, and drew a little Union flag. So they put out the experiments not long after putting the flag up. And of course, they threw away the little brackets that we'd signed and we got uh, a UK flag on the moon just after the American. NASA was on the moon. The USA had beaten the Soviet Union. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had raised the stars and stripes. But a small group of Brits had also played their part. But when they actually touched down, we sort of jumped up and said, we did it. We, we, we were part of the team that got them to the moon.